this is the last part of my message I started last, last week. And for those of you who are not here yesterday, I'm just going to give a recap of some of the things we talked about yes, uh, last week. But we're talking about the Christ-centered life. And one of the thing we talk, things we talked about last week, um, that being a Christian is a life that's fully, fully surrendered to the life of Christ. That's what we talked about last week. You know, your salvation, your Christianity did not begin at birth. Your Christianity, no one is born a Christian in this world, right? We agree to that. No one is ever born a Christian into this world. Your salvation began when the day you were born again into the family of God, the day you personally surrendered your life to Christ, the day when you told Jesus, Jesus, I believe that you are my Lord and I, I trust you for my salvation and I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. That day when you made that faithful confession to surrender, to give your life to Christ, that is the day of your salvation. That is the beginning of your Christian life. For some people, you're probably 60 years old when you said that. For, for some, maybe in your 30s. For me, I was 16 when that happened. Although I grew up in a Christian home. Although I grew up with parents who are believers. But I would say my Christianity, my relationship with Christ began that day at, at, my, at, our school, at my school campus. And this is the word that, that, that Paul is reminding us. And this is a promise of God that we need to hold on to, okay? That if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Not religion. Not the church. Not your parents who's going to save you. It is Jesus himself. And this rebirth, in fact, later on, we're going to witness a baptism. This rebirth is what baptism portrays. You know, you're being buried into your old life. And you're rising up into this new life in Christ. Now, when you say Jesus is your Savior, it means that you are fully trusting Jesus for your salvation. You're not trusting in good works. You're not trusting in religion. You're not trusting in the church for your salvation. Your salvation is, in, is trusting a person, a person, and that is Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross on your behalf. And when you say Jesus is your Lord, you're recognizing that Jesus is the son of the living God. That he created heaven and earth. That he made your, he created you. And that this, this Jesus who is, who is Lord, his, his, his divinity, his lordship is proven by his resurrection. That's why we Christians, we always proclaim his resurrection. Because the resurrection is evidence that Jesus is God. That Jesus is the son of God. And that not only that, that you are willing to follow him, to surrender your life to him, for the, you know, follow him for the rest of your life and surrender your life to him. Basically, surrender to his leadership, to surrender to his lordship. So that is the meaning of the statement, Jesus is Lord. It's not just a word you're going to say, yes, Jesus, Lord. It's not even the name of Jesus, by the way. Lord is not even his name, right? It's a title. You're saying, basically, Jesus, you are my master. Jesus, you are my king. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Whatever you're going to say, I'm going to do. That's the word Lord. That's what's behind that word. And, and, and this full surrender, this is what Jesus requires. This is what Jesus demands. If you go, and this is a picture I'm going to show you, that Jesus wants you to be the center of your life. He wants to rule your life. And that's the picture I want to show you. But if you go back, if you're going to go back to scriptures, and, and we talk about these scriptures last week, we're just going to go to this uh, in passing. Listen to these words. It talks about full surrender. Luke 9.23 says there, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Another passage, Luke 14, 23, it says there, In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. I said last week, you know, some people think this is extreme. No, this is normal Christianity. This is what it means to be a Christian. And if Christ is not like this to you, then you have to ask yourself if you really surrendered your life to Christ. If you are a Christian to begin with. Because this is what Jesus demands. Uh, in Luke 14, um, Luke 7, sorry, Matthew 7, just the second part, verse 14. This is the reason why many people are not able to follow Christ because, because they cannot meet these demands. That's why Jesus said in, in this passage in Matthew 7, small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only few find it. The, the, the path that Jesus wants us to tread is not, it's not wide. A lot of people are not going to find it. Sadly, even within the church, there are people within the church that might not find this. And even fewer realize this truth. This is a truth that we need to hold on to as well. In 1 Corinthians 2.9, that the eternal blessings, the eternal reward you're going to have, you're going to gain in Jesus Christ is infinitely much greater infinitely outweighs the small sacrifice you're going to offer Christ in this life. The passage says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Giving your life fully to Christ is just a small sacrifice compared to the blessing that you're going to receive, the reward you're going to receive in eternity. This is the demands of the gospel. This is what Jesus wants for every believer. But this is the reality. In today's world, the center of the lives, not just, of course, people of the world who are not believers in Jesus, of course, the center of their lives is themselves. But sadly, even among Christians, some Christians, the center of their lives is still themselves. Their God is not Jesus, but themselves. And Jesus Christ, it seems to be just an extra thing. They add to their lives among many other things. You know, there are many people who want to go to heaven. Even Christians, they say, I want to go to heaven. And, of course, he wants to escape hell. They want Jesus to be their savior. But they reject him as their Lord. And I heard this. From people. Yes, I want to go to heaven. I want all the blessing that I can receive from God in Jesus Christ, but I will not follow him as my Lord. And now Jesus becomes just one of those many things in their lives, and they think that Jesus is going to, this is the purpose of Jesus in their lives. They think that merely Jesus is just going to make their lives better. They think that Jesus is going to give them earthly prosperity. They think that Jesus is going to solve all their problems. They think that Jesus is going to improve their business. To them, Christ is no different than that blue thing in Aladdin. You know, that genie in Aladdin. Or Jesus is just another Santa Claus for these people. Just to satisfy whatever they desire in life. But here's the thing, they're unwilling to deny themselves, unwilling to, to give up their selfish ambitions. They're unwilling to carry the cross, they're unwilling to follow Christ. Jesus throughout his earthly ministry rebuked people to think like this. Oh, sorry, I don't have the verse there. In Luke, 5, uh, Luke 6, 46, it says there in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Oh, it's there. And do not do what I tell you. 
and, and, and think about this kind of people who only want the, the, you know, the convenience of following Jesus. They just, they, just, they just confess Christ out of convenience. Think about this. They become like the seed that fell on rocky soil. Remember the parable? And when the scorching heat of the sun hits, uh, he, uh, uh, when those, uh, when hits that uh, area, that soil, the word of God in their heart withers and dies. And these are people who say they believe in Jesus, they accept Christ, but when hardship come, when trials come, when persecution come, they walk away from Christ. They walk away from the church. Sorry. They walk away from Christ, walk away from the church, walk away from God. Clay? Clay is reminding me to change this stand to something more expensive and better. It's been a torture. Okay. Finance team, we're going to prove that. Okay. <laughs> okay. And also, when they gain success, they will say, Jesus, I follow you. But when they gain success, when they have lots of money, this is the seed that fell on the thorny soil. That the pleasures of life, the wealth of life, the, the things that you enjoy in life begins to choke that, that word of God in you to the point of death. They treat God as a spare tire and only approach God when there's problems in their life. Or oh, in good times, when, during good times, oh, they, you don't see them in church, you don't see them reading their Bible, you don't see them praying at all. And we know this kind of people who accepted Christ in this way, they never belong to God. They never belong to Christ. You know why? Because the gospel was not able to take root in their heart. That's, the, the parable actually talks about four kinds of soil. Only the last soil was a genuine follower of Christ, by the way. There's the pathway soil, uh, the, the rocky soil, and the thorny soil. Those three, the first three kinds of soil were not really believers in Christ. It was only the last soil. Because that's the, that was the only soil that to, the, where the seed was able to take root. So I pray that in this church and everyone here, if you're a believer in Christ, I pray that your faith is genuine. Amen? That's why in the last days, Jesus said that many are going to fall away. And the reason is why, why it's going to happen, because there's going to be intense persecution in the last days and the, the, the genuine one, the genuine followers of Christ, they're going to they're gonna be faithful towards the end but those who are pretenders and who are not really true followers of Christ like Judas you know, he was not a true follower of Christ, Judas they're going to fall away, they're going to give up they're not, they're not going to really stick with Christ till the end so this is talking about people who don't have Christ in their lives. Or maybe they think that they have Christ in their lives. But for you, genuine believers, followers of Christ, this kind of mindset, this selfish form of Christianity that we've been talking about can also affect you. And Sadly, this affects many Christians today. And, and you can see this. You can see this happening all the time. You know, um, this is what we mostly, this, we, 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 we struggle with this. I struggle with this as well. You know, we think that God is just going to fulfill whatever we want. For our lives, any selfish desire, anything we want, we think that God is just going to give it to you by, by just sticking something in Jesus' name at the end of your prayer. You know, we think something like that. Sometimes we think that the Christian life is going to be a problem-free life. We think that the Christian life is going to be comfortable, that you're not going to have any problems. Everything's going to be smooth and easy. That's what we think. 
We all, some people think that the Christian life is going to be, you're going to be materially prosperous. You're going to have promotions in your job. You're going to have good times in your business, whatever. And this is what many Christians, Christians expect from God. That they're going to be healthy. Right? And if God is not going to meet his end of the deal, what are these people going to do? What are Christians going to do? They walk away from God and say, God, oh, you don't answer my prayer. Oh, you're not real. Or oh, you're not in that church. Or oh, I don't like to go to church anymore because, you know, you're not solving my problem. You're not dealing with my financial issue. You're not healing me. They walk away from God. And, and I would say these are some these people, some of them, are probably true believers, but they have an incorrect view of who God is and who what Jesus, who Jesus is, and what Christ expects of us. And they and some of them throw a tantrum like a toddler, you know, and start rejecting God, being angry at God. But here's the thing. Did you know that none of this is promised to us in the Bible? The Bible doesn't promise a comfortable life. If you can give me a verse that tells you that God is going to make your life comfortable, then I'm going to change my mind. But the Bible never promises a comfortable life. The Bible never promises a problem-free life. God did not promise that you're going to be healthy physically. Yes, he's going to heal you if you're going to ask him. It's according to his will. But there's no promise that you're going to be 100% healthy all the time. The Bible doesn't promise that you're going to, have, you're, that you're going to be wealth, wealthy. But here's the thing that the Bible promises. That God promised to give you peace. He promises to give you joy. He promises to supply all your needs. That's what the Bible promises. He promises that you will, the Bible promises that we're going to experience the fullness of life, fulfillment, and that you'll be able to accomplish the purpose of God. Those are the promises. And, and that even in the, in the most dark portions of your life and the greatest and probably the brightest portions of our life, good and bad things in our life, God is able to use it ultimately for his good, for your good, for his glory. This is, this is what the Bible promises. So if you desire to overcome that sin that you've been struggling all your life, put Christ in the center of your life. Let him be the center of your life. If you, you want to accomplish the purpose of God that he has planned for you before the foundation of the world. Did you know that God has already a plan for you before the world was even created? If you want to accomplish that, if that is something you desire to accomplish, put Christ at the center of your life. If you desire to grow in faith and that God is going to use you, to help others grow in faith as well. Help others come to know Christ and be saved. Put Christ at the center of your life. So the next question we're going to deal with is. How do we keep Christ at the center of our lives each day? How do we do this? Remember last week I told you, I gave you an illustration. That Jesus that's not, he doesn't want you to be, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be just the co-pilot. This is, this is one evidence of a self-centered Christianity today. Because many Christians, they just want Jesus to be their, you know, co-pilot. No, Jesus doesn't want to be your co-pilot. He wants to take over the driver's seat of your life. He wants to take over the steering wheel of your life. And you, your job is to step aside. But somebody asked a question last week. That's why I need to answer that. Uh, some of you. So if Jesus is going to be the ruler of my life, the Lord of my life, he's going to take over the driver's seat of my life, take the steering wheel, hold, take hold of the steering wheel of my life, 
then what am I supposed to do? Should I just sit down at the back seat and like, you know, riding in a limo and just there and do nothing? As a Christian, Jesus, take care of everything for my life. I'm just going to here relax. You know, you do whatever you want to do in my life. I'm just going to relax. That's not the kind of Christianity I want to talk to you about. I'm not talking about do not, the do-nothing Christian. I think there's a lot of that today as well. So how do you keep Christ at the center of our lives? It is summed up in this one verse that Kayla just read earlier. It's, it's one of those passages. But um, I'm going to focus only on verse 5 of John 15. And, and I want to, you really to focus on this passage. This is what Jesus said. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Two key state, statements there. One, Jesus commands us to remain in him. Okay? And, and as a result, that is the... That's, that is what he commands us to do. Remain in him. And as a result, he says, you will bear much fruit. So it's a cause and an effect kind of thing. So for Christ to accomplish his work through you, for him to be able to accomplish what he desires through your life, his purpose through your life, his will through your life, that is his job, that is his responsibility. He wants to do that through you. Your responsibility, your part is to remain in him. He says there, remain in me. In other translations, if you've read other translations of the passage, remain there means to abide, to hold on to, to hold on to Christ, to continue in Christ, to be joined with Christ. So that, that is the meaning, that those are other words that, that, in other translations, uh, that they use for the word remain. And he says there that apart from me, meaning apart from remaining in Christ, what does he say? You can do nothing. Our Christian life, who we are, highly depends on this, to remain in Christ. Or else you, are not, you will not be able to bear fruit as a Christian. And you can do nothing. You cannot accomplish of any eter anything of eternal significance. Meaning everything you're, you're going to be accomplishing is going to be worthless in the eyes of God. But when you remain in Christ, whatever you're going to accomplish, it will have eternal significance. Now, did you know that this pattern exists throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you see this over and over and over again. And, and what I'm sharing to you today, this pattern here, this way of God, on, on, I'm going to explain this more later on, but, but this pattern that you find in this passage, it, it is God's way. It is how he deals with humanity. And I'm going to show you what this is. What God is doing here in this passage he, uh, he is asking each of you to do something. Listen to this. He is asking each of you to do something within your control and within your ability. It is something you can do. And it, there's no excuse for you to not to do this. The task, the responsibility of remaining in Christ. And the task of, rem of remaining in Christ, it's something easy to do. Let me say that again. The task of remaining in Christ, it's something easy to do within your control. You can schedule it. You can put it on your calendar. And you have the ability to do it. Okay? Remember the passage found in uh, Matthew eleven thirty 30 says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Meaning what Jesus expects us to do is easy and, and light. Okay? Now going back to that passage again, Jim. 
But the second one, the bearing fruit part, this is something that God is responsible for. It's something that only God can do and you cannot do it on your own. It's outside of your control. It's beyond your ability. And it, of course, it's God's responsibility. So think about these two things here. Remaining in Christ is your responsibility. Bearing fruit, it's God's responsibility. And it's only him who can do this. And again, another thing about the bearing fruit, that is the difficult part. That is the difficult, difficult part. But the good thing is, praise God, it's not your job. <laughs> it's God's job. And we're, we're going to look at this. Now, I want, I want you to see this first. You know, this is all over the Bible. We can spend all week talk about every verse, every passage, every story in the Bible that reflects this. But, but I want to give you an example from the New Testament. Let's start with Luke 9.23. Oh, sorry, go back up, Jimmy. Romans. Yeah, Romans 6.19. Now, now, concentrate on this passage. This is a long passage. I just took the last part. But concentrate on this passage first. Offer yourself as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. Slaves to righteousness is something within your ability. You can do it. It is easy. It's not too difficult. But being able to live a holy life is hard. And only God can do it. What he's saying here, what Paul is saying here is that as you offer your bodies as slaves to righteousness, holiness will happen. Because God is going to do something to your life. As you remain in God, in Christ, as you, as you hold on to him, you begin to bear fruit. You see the cause and the effect. And this is what God expects of us. And this is what God promises to do as you do this. Now let's, let's look at one more example. Then we're going to go, go look at one example from the Old Testament. He said to, to them all, we just read this passage earlier. If you want to become my disciples, we are to take up our cross and follow him. Living the life of Christ is not easy. You cannot live the life of Christ in your own strength. But did you know that carrying the cross is easy? It's not difficult, by the way. And you can do it. It's within your ability. I'm going to explain what carrying the cross means. So you see this pattern in the New Testament. Now I'm going to give you one example from the Old Testament. It's the story of Joshua and the walls of Jericho. And I'm going to read to you this account. We don't have to read the entire chapter 6. It's the whole of chapter 6 of Joshua. But I'm going to read some parts of verse chapter 5 then go to chapter 6. So I want you to, to walk with me here in this story. Think with me in this story. Okay? Now when Joshua was near Jericho... Uh, background, the, the people of Israel were about to conquer the promised land and they just crossed the river Jordan and they're about to deal, to confront the first, their first uh, enemy, you know, the people of Jericho. That was the first group of people that they are gonna, they're going to conquer uh, as, they, as they claim the promised land. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword on his hand. Oh, there was this angel of the Lord. And Joshua approached him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Of course, we know this, who this person is. This person is Jesus showing up before Joshua, appearing before Joshua. And Joshua confronted this angel and said, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have, I have now come as a commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua fa fell face down and reverence and asking him, what does my Lord have to say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy. Now Jericho, verse, starting with verse, uh, this verse 6, 1, next Jimmy. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. Very, everything was closed down. No one went out and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, Behold, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its mighty men of valor. 
march around us. This is what the, 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 the angel told Joshua. March around the city with all the men of war, with all their armor and everything, weapons. They're going to march around the city, circle the city one time, do this for six days. Then have seven priests carry seven rams, ram horns in front of the ark. Then on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. Then the priests blow the horn, well, while the priests blow the horns, and when there is a long blast of the ram's horn, as you hear it sound, have all people give a mighty shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse, and the people will go up, and each man uh, straight ahead. You're going to destroy the people of Jericho. You're going to be successful. Now, think about this. Who took care of the difficult task here? What was the difficult task here? Bringing down the wall. Did you know that wall is almost 50 feet tall? Almost 50 feet. It's a huge wall. That was a huge wall. And probably it was impossible for the Israelites to deal with that wall. They probably are not able to scale it, bring it down or whatever. They, they have no way of overcoming that wall. And, 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 and what did God do? Did God tell them, hey, bring all your chisels and your shovels and, and, what, and your ra battering ram and everything? All of you, let's all bang. We can hit in this wall. Bang. Did what, is that what God told them to do? God told them to do something ridiculous, right? <laughs> and we're supposed to destroy these people, destroy this wall. But now God is telling me, Oh, just march around the wall one time each day for six days. Then and blow your horns. Then on the seventh day, you're going to march seven times, blow your horns again, and, and shout. Okay. <laughs> How on earth are you going to break those walls by just walking around and, and you know, making music and shouting? Oh, you know what happened? The wall came down. What did the Israelites do? It was an act of righteousness. It was an act of obedience. They chose to remain in Christ, to hold on to God, to hold on to the God, commands of God, and the fruit came out, which is the tearing down of the wall. They did what God told them to do, which seemed to be very, very different than what God really wanted to accomplish. But that's how God works. You know, this, this is a principle you find in the Bible over and over again. Remember Naaman. What did, what did Elijah told Naaman? Just to dip in the Jordan River, take a bath, and you're going you're gonna to be healed. Uh, uh, remember um, uh, Gideon. And, and go over everything in the Bible. God tells you to do something that's, too, you think, oh Lord, this is too easy. I don't think this is going to work. Is, is, is walking around the wall difficult? Even a baby can do it. <laughs> Blowing your trumpets. Oh, Irwin can do it easily, right? Uh, shouting. Is it easy? Yeah. Now, breaking that wall. Is it easy? Even if you have a thousand chisels, you're probably not able to break that wall. It was 50 feet, 50 feet tall. This is a principle that we find in the Bible. and This is the way of God. This is one of his ways on how he deals with us. He asks us to do certain things. And he does his part. But you have to do this. So when you think about Christ being in the driver's seat of your life. And you're just there at the back seat. You're not supposed to do nothing. There is something that you need to do. And the Bible calls it remaining in him. And I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to give you a laundry list. And this is a lot, but that's why I printed this up. And to show you what does it mean to remain in Christ and what are fruit in our life. So, Carlo, can you give one sheet per table? A one, there's five for each. Uh, there's five in each uh, set. Yeah. Just, just one each table. Yeah. If you need one, just add. I'm going to show you what this what remain means and what fruit means. 
And okay. And and we're gonna end in this. Okay. Okay. Everyone got it? Okay, there are two columns in that chart there. And the one side there is remain. And the other side is fruit. And so let me let me say what I said earlier again. Now when you remain in Christ, that's your responsibility. In fact, the Bible says that we are to be slaves of righteousness. So it tells us that these are things that you need to be slaves of these things. You need to be devoted to these things. You need to be slaves to this. And, and you are to take up your cross. So the, the left side is what to, keeps you at the center, keeps Christ at the center of your life. And there are four areas there. One is remain in the word of God. Uh, in John 8, um, 31, I didn't. I don't have these verses in the, on the screen, but just, just to make sure you know that I'm not making up these things. John 8, 31 to 32, it says here, he said, if you abide in my word, if you remain in my word, you are my disciples. So the first thing that we need to remain into is to remain, hold on to the word of God. So, so for you to remain in Christ, in his word, is to listen to his word, to read his word, to study his word, to memorize his word, to meditate on his word, to obey his word. Now, let me ask you, is that easy? Relatively easy, right? Versus tearing down walls. How many of you can read the Bible each week for 15 minutes or 15 minutes each day? It's not too difficult, right? And what he promises is that, that if you are faithful in remaining in his word, it's going to result with, number one, you'll have increased faith. The fruit is increased faith. You have peace and joy. You have, you're able to overcome sin. You'll have a pure heart. You have confidence in sharing your faith. All the verses are there that, that supports it. You have spirit, spiritual growth, spiritual health. You're going to have prayers that are answered. You will know God's guidance. You will know the will of God. You will have strength and joy to, to, to during trials. This is the fruit. This is God's job. All this on the right side of the column is God's responsibility. That is what he promised to do in your life. But you have to do this first. You have to remain in him. You have to be faithful in his word. And then God will do these things. You live a life that is full. Beyond expectation, you'll have good success. This is according to Psalm 1, 3. He said to meditate on the word of God day and night, and you'll be like a tree planted by the streams of living water. Your leaves are not going to wither. You're going to yield your fruit in seasons. It's a very amazing promise, but you have to meditate on the word of God. And so we need to remain in the word of God. Another thing, we have to remain in prayer. It's found in John 15, 7. John 15, 7 says, as, oh, it says there, um, let me see. if you abide in me, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. It talks about remaining in prayer. And how do you remain in prayer? Spend time with God each day. In fact, if you can give your first hour to God each day, do it. First hour each day to God. Do it. Uh, praise the Lord all day. Psalm 113.3. From the rising of the sun till its setting. The name of the Lord will be praised. Give thanks to the Lord in all circumstances. You know this verse. Uh, confess every known sin. First just, first John 1 John 1.9. Pray for the church. Pray for the church. The people who serve. Pray for others. Pray for yourself. Pray for God's will and purposes be accomplished and be done. Matthew 6.10. That's from the Lord's Prayer. And as you begin to remain in God, in Christ, in prayer, you're able to overcome temptation. Remember the, the disciples when they were in the in Garden of Gethsemane, what did Jesus say? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into, sin, into temptation. Prayer helps you overcome temptation. And by the way, the Word of God helps you overcome sin as well. 
Uh, you'll have passion and fire in your heart for Christ. You have power to accomplish God's will. You have the ability to live a holy life. You're able to do everything that God calls you to do. Of course, we're not going to be perfect in this life, but at least fully more and more of what God wants you to do. You'll have the character of Christ forming you. You know what this is? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Meekness, gentleness, self-control. We need that. I need that. I need self-control. Yeah. I could eat five meals a day if I don't have self-control. Uh, no, and love Christ more. You learn to love Christ more. By the way, learning to love Christ is not something you can force yourself to do. You cannot force yourself to love Christ. It's very hard. Agree? It's hard. But if you are faithful in prayer, faithful in the word, you're going to see that happen in your life. And think like Christ. You have the mind of Christ. You're going to think like the way God thinks. You're going to think the way Christ thinks. As you are faithful in the word, as you spend time with God, you notice that the right, left column is easy to do. The other side, it's impossible. <laughs> I cannot overcome sin on my own. Right? I always fall. You, you know, whenever I get discouraged sometimes, or I struggle with some kind of thing or sin, this is how I think now. I said, okay, it's, I'll, I'll just have seven devotions. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to read the Bible five days a week. I'm going to pray uh, day and night. I'm going to read a Christian book, maybe listen to a sermon this week. I'm going to be okay afterwards. <laughs> no, no, this, I, I'm like a doctor now to myself, right, Clay? These are, these are the prescription. <laughs> because once you begin to reign in Christ, the things that seem impossible becomes possible. It's amazing. Uh, remain in fellowship. And this is many of us falter. We fail on this. We are to faithfully meet with other believers. Hebrews 10.25, let's not give up meeting with other Christians faithfully. We worship together, and we even worship in music, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are to teach one another, teach other people like what I'm doing. Did you know that this is not just my responsibility? All of you are supposed to teach one another. It's not, the, it's not just the pastor's job. All of you are supposed to teach. Maybe... And maybe, yeah, well, let's just schedule that. It's, it's going to take, take a while. Uh, we are to train younger believers in faith. I'm not talking about younger people in age, but younger people in the faith. This is discipleship. We do this in our church now. Uh, you are to use your gifts and abilities to serve God. You are to financially support the church, church or ministry. You are to break bread together, the Lord's Prayer, share a meal. You are to love one another, serve one another, pray together, pray with, for one another, encourage one another, carry one another's burden, forgive one another, and there's other, other probably 25 more. Um, it's a long list. I don't have it there. But you notice that these are things, let me say this, these are things that you can do. Because if you look at what God is about to do through this, the fruit, look at that. Gift and ability to serve others, you cannot do it. Do you think you have the ability to preach here in front? Do you think I have the ability? I, I don't have. I, I, I just, it, I know it's all God who just did this because I, 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 I would rather stay in my, with my computer in one room and not talk to people. I mean, that's my nature. But somehow God changed the whole thing. The ability to speak God's word. It's the, he's the one who's going to do it. Growth in the church. By the way, we cannot make the church grow. That's not in our ability to help the church grow in number and in maturity. That's not my job. I cannot do it. I'm just going to be frustrated and disappointed. If I want more people to come to the church, that's not my job. It is God. My job is to be faithful in coming here, is to be faithful in teaching the word of God, is to be faithful in supporting the church in every way, serving in what I have, uh, with what I have, to eat together, Lord's Supper, serve, whatever. The, the remain portion is that I'm, all these other things is going to come out 
The ability to love others, that is God's job. Do you think it's easy to love a stranger? Especially a stranger that, that, that you don't like to hang around with? It's very hard, right? right? But God can do it through you as you remain in him. Your job is to do this left side and he's going to take care of this right side. God's wisdom, awareness of his presence, experience the love of God, supplication of your need. Uh, God will supply all your need. Uh, this is in reference to Philippians 4.19, which talks about serving others. God is saying that as you serve others, he's going to take care of your needs. And lastly, remain in witness. In witnessing, this is your job. You need to hold firmly to the gospel. You need to be always prepared to share the gospel. That is something you can do. You just have to keep on reading and reading the gospel message. Master the gospel. Read and read and read and until you memorize the gospel. That is something within your control that is easy. That's your job. And, and you are to find ways to present the gospel. That should be easy. If there's someone there who needs to hear you, just talk. Be courageous. Um, uh, pray for salvation. Pray for opportunities. And witness with your love and life. So that's something within your control. And this is what God will do. He's promised his fruit. He says, people are going to be saved through what you are preaching. That is God's job. Your job is just to speak. But, but who will convince people? Who will, who will uh, uh, save people? It's God. People will repent and believe the message. That is God's responsibility. Uh, opportunities to share the gospel. That is God's responsibility. He's going to open those opportunities. Uh, salvation of lost soul. That is God's responsibility. Others seeing the light of Christ in your life. That is also God's responsibility. You cannot force the light of Christ to shine into you. Some people will like to smile all the time and to look holy by how they dress and how they live. But the truth is you cannot force holiness. It should come out naturally as you remain in Christ. And I hope, I pray that this message is very clear. And I pray that this is, you know, your responsibility as Christians. And the reason why you're not growing in Christ, the reason why no one, you're not, you, you never been able to share the gospel to anyone and, and help someone come to know Christ, or you never discipled anyone, or you feel that God has never used you, maybe because you're not remaining in him. You're not fulfilling all these things that you're supposed to do. So when we talk about Christ taking the driver's seat and you're at the back seat, while in the back seat, these are the things that you're supposed to do. And it's a lot. You have a lot of things to do, by the way. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> this is just a short list. There's still more. <laughs> and, and you know what is this? The remain portions. These are the commands of Christ. These are his commands. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. I pray that my ch this church and everyone here is encouraged through this preaching, Lord. That out of this sermon, Lord, we know what we need to do. We know what we need to prioritize. We know our responsibility as Christians. And I so praise you, Lord, that, that the things you want us to do, it's easy, it's light, it's, it's not impossible to do. It is within our control, Lord God. It's something we can do. And you allowed us to do this, Lord, because you love us, oh God. Because you decided, Lord God, before time began. That you will take care of the things that's beyond our control. That you will take care of the things that we don't have any way of control, of dealing with on our own, oh God. We don't have the strength, nor the ability, nor the wisdom, nor the knowledge, oh God, to deal with a lot of things, Lord. But I praise you, God, that you have given us means, oh God, a way to march around a wall in our, walls in our lives that are very impo are impossible to conquer, Lord. Lord, I'm so glad that you just called us to march and blow the horns and shout, oh God. You will, you will be the one to tear down the walls, Lord. Lord, help us to remain in you. Help us to do this exactly, Lord. Not just on Sundays, but every day, Lord, and every day of our lives, oh God. Because we are supposed to carry the cross daily, Lord. And the Lord, remaining in you is what it means to carry the cross. Lord God, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, I pray for your grace and power upon my brothers and sisters. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. 
and grant us your strength, God, to do this, Lord, beginning today, Lord, and that we will be faithful in remaining in Christ for the rest of our life. If this is something you're going to commit to, a willingness, you have, the, you, have, you have a desire in your heart to commit to this, to remain in him, I just want you to write, raise up, stand up and say, Lord, I'm going to commit to remain in you, Lord God. Not just today, but for the rest of my life. If this is something God wants you to do, you feel in your heart, I want to do this, Lord. I want to do this. I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up and, 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 and make that commitment before God. I'm going to do this. This is a burden that I can do, Lord God, by your strength. This is something I can do, oh God. And Lord, I just ask for your grace. I just ask for your, I ask for your mercy, Lord. Don't be ashamed. Don't, don't be afraid. It's, between, it's a commitment between you and God. And talk to him and say, Lord, Lord, I ask for your grace that you help me remain in you every day, Lord, to hold on to you each day, to carry the cross, Lord Jesus. And tell him, Lord, Lord, I pray that you be glorified through my life, that, Lord, my life will bear fruit, Lord, fruit that will last, oh God, that will last not only in this lifetime, but for all eternity, oh God. Lord, I pray for your spirit to, be, to, to fill every heart here today, Lord. Pray for encouragement that comes from your spirit, Lord. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you've given us a way, Lord God, a very clear way, oh God, and how to live the Christian life, oh God. Oh, Lord. It's for you are the vine and we are the branches. Any man remains in you, he will bear much fruit. Apart from you, Lord Jesus, we can do nothing. And Lord, as we come together, Lord God, and, and celebrating the salvation of a life that has surrendered to you, Lord, the life of Kayla, Lord. Lord, I ask, Lord, that your grace be upon us.